Bill of Rights and Constitution and rolling out NSA spying publicly, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, rolling out torture, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, but it's really for the general public, rolling out total control and the end of any underground free market systems in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda, but really shutting down any type of free commerce. This is all about converting us from a free society to a tyranny with a capital T. And I say this humbly, but I've asked certain people who say, well, you're a conspiracy theorist and they call you the same. I said, but do you read the scriptures of the Bible and Quran? Is not Satan real? Evil is real, so Satan is real. Evil is preponderant in the earth, and that is because the mind of Satan who, that is being transmitted through religion, through education, through the economics and politics of the situation so that Satan is in control of a vast enterprise of institutions that foster ideas that put human beings against themselves and against God and against each other. So there's real conspiracy and we are in the middle of it as we are dialoguing. That really is a revolutionary thought that if you question the establishment, you question what they're saying when they're known liars, you're a conspiracy theorist. That's like saying you're a heretic. Okay, well, if we're a heretic against the system, I guess we're a heretic against the devil because this system undoubtedly, you couldn't call it good. And from my research, that's my concern. The 5%, the 1%, the one-tenth of 1%, that actually run and control, manipulate things, they believe they're going to end up winning. They believe that they're getting ahead of people by keeping folks dumbed down. But common sense shows, and, and just my gut tells me, you don't screw people over and then long term get away with it. It comes back on you. And I think the people serving this system are some of the most deceived out there because they know how the world really works, but they've decided to basically try to screw over their fellow humans as if they're going to get ahead by doing that. I mean, just anybody who's God-fearing in their gut level has to know that's a lie. Well, Mr. Jones, in reality, there are those who go along to get along. And there are those who will take money or position or promises of nearness to power to become an instrument of power. They know what they're doing, but they do not know the vast evil that they are a part of. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my teacher said, we are living now in a very dangerous time. He said there never has been a time where on the earth there is 100% dissatisfaction. Whites are dissatisfied, blacks are dissatisfied, there are Jews and Gentiles that are dissatisfied. Well, what is creating the dissatisfaction? It is the deprivation of rights and privileges. It is the deprivation of truth. It is the deprivation of justice. It is the deprivation of equity. It is the deprivation of equality of opportunity that each human being should have to bring out of themselves what God has put within that they in their person may glorify God and create a world better than the world in which we find ourselves. So the politicians today, I, I looked at the many Republicans and Democrats that are trying to win the nomination of their party. And it says to me, you know, it's like a, I don't want to be vulgar, but it's like you, in any major city, you see women undressed showing their wares for a John to buy them. And it's like 
politicians who don't have money but have ideas and they parade themselves before rich and powerful people to get money apparently for their ideas that the rich agree with but the moment that they become what they're looking to become they find that the rich have an agenda for them that the rich have something to ask of them like the John asks of the prostitute. And that's one of the things that I admire about Mr. Trump because he told them all, I don't want your money. Politicians are all talk, no action. Most of them don't know what they're doing. They just could run. They like, you know, like you wind them up and they run for office. They're controlled fully by the lobbyists by the donors and by the special interests fully. And you said recently, quote, when you give, they do whatever the hell you want them to do. You better believe it. So what specifically did they do? If I ask them, if I need them, you know, most of the people on this stage I've given to, just so you understand, a lot of money. And when a politician does not want money from the rich, he's freer than the others to really do good for the masses of the people. And I think that today uh, we are in the midst of the darkest hour in American history. And so if we don't make the right move with the right people at the right time, the America that we know, we're not going to see it become great again. I'd like to speak some more, if you would, about Donald Trump because I personally just had my snapshot view of him, seeing him on TV, shows like The Apprentice. I mean, I knew about his businesses and things. But then as he became more and more prominent in the race and the last six months has been in the, in, the, in the front runner, I saw the media doing what they've done to you, myself, and many others, really taking over and over again what he said out of context uh, countless times. And it didn't even mean I totally agree with what he was saying, but I could see the fix was in that they really didn't like him. Then I saw the Republican and Democrats giving money against him. Uh, and then I saw him say, hey, we're going to start taxing these big brokerage firms that are tax exempt, make them bring their money back here. We're not going to have NAFTA and GATT one-sided to ship our jobs to other countries. He said, I'm not against China and India, but, but you know, I, I'm sorry, there's no way to do business here the way they've set it up. All these multinationals wanted to move overseas, so they wrote laws to make it more conducive. And that's really where he's got them mad. And so undoubtedly, the establishment is after him. And now he's come out and pointed out that Bill Clinton has settled rape cases and, and said, you know, forget going after Bill Cosby. Let's see Bill Clinton gone after. That tells me right there that he's for real. Uh, and then talking to some of his high-level campaign people, they talk about the fact that Trump used to, and he told me this on air, he used to just be focused on business and life. He's just now, the last few years, looking into what's happening and finding out the country's been sold out. I'm not trying to even fully endorse Trump here. All I know is the anger of the power structure towards him is real, and so I think everybody should investigate more why that is. And I think it's because he does get on the stage and says, listen, I'm not going to lie. I bought all these people on this stage. That's just how this country works. I don't want to do that. So from your experience uh, in all, you know, tracking the media, experiencing demonization campaigns, it's a big deal to have the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan come out and say, hey, uh, we should look at Trump. Can you flesh that out and elaborate? Because undoubtedly, uh, they're going to try to you know, take that and then twist it. Well, I said recently that um, if the American people voted for Trump, he could take them into the abyss of hell. He's free, he's rich, he hates political correctness, and rightly so, but he said some things that I would hope that he would get around him persons who could help him because as a businessman, 
par excellence. He has people around him to help him do business. But if he says, let's go in to Iraq and take the oil, that puts him in the class of those neoconservatives who had a project for a new American century. And they wrote to Bill Clinton and Trent Lott, and they talked about attacking Iraq and taking out Saddam Hussein, not just because he may be in their eyes a dictator and was once on the payroll of the CIA in the war against uh, Iran and Ayatollah Khomeini, but he had become a thorn in their sides and they wanted to get rid of him. He kind of become a Trump. He was doing his own thing. Yes. That was his crime. And that is the crime of those who refuse to come under the control of the IMF or the World Bank, who send these people like Mr. Perkins in his book, The, um, the Tales of an Economic Hitman, who would go into a small country and tell them how they could improve this and that, but they would have to borrow money. When I was in Nigeria, President Abacha told me that they came to him and offered him billions of dollars to loan. And Mr. Abacha said, I don't need your money because the oil that we have is sufficient to get us to do all the good things that we want to do. Well, a few years later, he's dead. Well, now here, Mr. Trump, if he would look at this project for an American century, and I'm sure you have read uh, their writings where they appeal to Bill Clinton to uh, get rid of Saddam as part of America's foreign policy. He didn't go along with it. And those members of the new American century now got into the inside of government under the Bush administration. And General Wesley Clark, he said he was introduced to a memo in, I think it was 2001, a memo that came from the neoconservatives that they wanted regime change in seven Islamic countries in five years time. I went through the Pentagon 10 days after 9-11. I couldn't stay away from Mother Army. I went back there to see Don Rumsfeld. I'd worked for him as a White House fellow in the 1970s. All this is in the book. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office. It says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. All of those countries now are boiling with internal strife. And, and it's a conspiracy, a public one of PNAC, to go in, destabilize, put radicals in, uh, kill the non-radicals, go after the Christians, all of this, to then foment a collapse, flood Europe with all these refugees, some of them will end up being attackers, and then you get an even bigger war on Islam. It's all part of that master plan. You're absolutely right. Trump contradicts himself, and I don't think through being ungenuine, he says, don't go into Iraq. It's a bad idea. But then he says, but let's do what the neocons say and take the oil. I mean, not putting words in your mouth, uh, Minister Farrakhan, but are you saying you're attracted to the fact that he is a maverick and that he says what he's really thinking, but at the same time, 